I think we're ready to start. There's something wrong with my video, but um, it's okay. You guys can see my picture, I guess. Uh, so thanks everyone for, for joining here. Welcome to today's behavioral science talk. This is Alki Leopoulou on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School Bo Board of Alumni Association of New England. And I'm gonna paste the link, a link here in, the, in our chat if you'd like to support our work. Um, so you can find the you can find our link here. Um, and today our talk is uh, attracted a lot of attention. So that comes to say uh, what's happening uh, today and the needs of our of of our community. So we're gonna have a talk by Harvard Business School professor Ashley Willens on being time smart during COVID. So Ashley is, uh, is the author of Time Smart. I'm gonna paste the link as well for, for her book if you're interested to learn more. So um, as always, our talks are by researchers that do research uh, to have an evidence-based approach uh, to their recommendations and they don't only rely on expert advice. So really appreciate this, uh, this feedback that uh, Ashley is gonna give us and her recommendations. And we're co-hosting this event with the Harvard Clubs of Mary McVally and their colleagues from the Harvard Club of North Shore and Concord. And today I'd like you to meet Rod Kessler, if you want to say hi, Rod, uh, he's the president of the North Shore Club. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. It's my pleasure to join you and um, let's have some fun. Thanks, Rod. And I'd like to thank again, um, Rachel Chris Klo from the from the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Relations because we couldn't do anything without her. So thanks again, Rachel. Uh, next up, we have a talk by Daniel Goldman, author of Emotional Intelligence. So I'd like you to save the date for December 10th if you're interested in his uh, 25th anniversary of the publication of the Emotional Intelligence. And I'm going to give you a link for that. Ashley, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for, for making this. This means a lot to us. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for having me. Just before I have you off the phone here, you can see my screen okay. Everything look okay. Everything looks good. And just, just a reminder for people, uh, just add your questions in the Q&A and then we'll just uh, tackle them at the end of the presentation with Ashley. Yeah, great. I'm going to aim to try to be economical with my time as a time and happiness researcher and talk for about 30 minutes and then we can open the floor to, to some conversations. So I've been thinking a lot about time, money and happiness over the course of my research career and I recently published a book uh, called Time Smart, How to Reclaim Your Time and Live a Happier Life. And interestingly, uh, COVID presents a unique opportunity for us to reimagine our relationship with time, but also time affluence and time uh, has become uh, more difficult during the work from home period of time. So I'm gonna start my presentation just telling you a little bit about myself, my research background, talk about some COVID specific findings we have, some strategies out of empirical research that we can all use to take control over our time and hopefully live a less stressful and happier life. Um, and then I will, of course, open the floor to questions um, and talk a little bit about some specific strategies we've been observing to be particularly helpful in this work from home environment. So I'm a social psychologist by training and I became really interested in the study, the psychological study of happiness, which is really broken down into two main components, understanding how people come to understand for themselves that they live a good life, this overall life evaluation component, and then how much joy, sadness, stress, worry that we experience on an everyday basis, this effective emotional response. I became really interested in understanding what it means to live a good life, how people come to understand their overall life evaluation and what factors predict the amount that the happiness and joy people experience on an everyday basis in part by following the work of Ed Diener, who's a professor at the University of Virginia. And one quote that he says is probably the biggest insight into happiness is biggest insight in the happiness field is that happy, happiness is not just a place, but it is also a process. Happiness is an ongoing process of fresh challenges and it takes the right attitude and activities to continue to be happy. I spent time at the University of British Columbia studying how one activity, namely how we spend our money can have uh, impacts for happiness when we spend money on others, when we spend money on experiences, this predicts daily happiness and overall life satisfaction to a greater extent than making material purchases. And so I also became interested in whether spending our time might also have dramatic impacts for happiness. Um, so before launching into some of my empirical work on this question, I want everyone to think about what comes to mind when they think about time. So what feelings and behaviors come to mind? Everyone can just take a minute to do that. 
maybe when you're thinking about time, you're thinking about the ways that you spend time on an everyday basis that are positive and meaningful, like volunteering, spending time with your friends and family, snuggling up to your favorite furry critter. My cat might make a guest appearance in this, uh, in this conversation today. But if you're like most of us, maybe, uh, or many of us also experience negative feelings of stress when thinking about time. In large representative surveys of uh, working adults that I've conducted all over the world and including in a collaboration with the Gallup World Poll, we find that over 80% of working adults in the US, for example, in a poll of 3 million Americans, report feeling time poor. That is, they report feeling overwhelmed by the demands of work and life. So if you are, if you feel when you are thinking about time that you fall into this left quadrant more than the right, um, that is normal and we see this in our, our survey data as well. Although working from home provides the opportunity for all of us to be more time affluent via less commutes, less business travel, my colleagues have found research or conducted research using Microsoft Analytics Teams data showing that in this forced experiment that we're all in, in working from home due to the COVID pandemic, we're actually spending more time working. So in a data set with 3 million people in 16 global cities, the researchers found that the average workday is increased by about 8% or nearly an hour each and every day. Part of this is because we're sending more emails in the virtual environment. Every conversation has to become a meeting or a, an email. We can't just have those hallway conversations. So if you feel like you're sending more email, their data suggests you're right, you are. If you feel like you're having more meetings, again, uh, their data suggests that in fact you are. So the work from home environment, as I mentioned before, where every conversation has to be a meeting means that our days are stretching on longer and longer and we're spending ever more time it seems on Zoom like we are right now because it's the mechanism by which we have to communicate with one another but is it, it is elongating our day and expanding the work day beyond the typical nine to five. In data that we've collected from 88 countries in 44 states, with over 44,000 responses, we have almost double this now, actually. We've been collecting continuously over the COVID uh, period of time since March. We find that most employees that are working remotely during this period feel less productive. So people report that they have lost productive work time and gained unproductive work time, probably because of all those emails and additional meetings uh, that Jeff Polzer and Rafael Ascendun's meet data suggests that we're all in. Unsurprisingly, employees with kids are feeling especially unproductive. Um, so those that have kids under the age of 18 and our data living at home are the ones who are reporting having experienced the most unproductive, additional unproductive work time and the greatest losses in productive work time. And when it comes to unproductivity, most employees that we're serving are saying that distraction is a major challenge. So those who are most feeling like they're not able to get productive time, that they're feeling most unproductive, are those who are feeling the most distraction during their workday. And it makes sense. Um, these distractions are coming, um, uh, and, and working parents are feeling this, especially in our data. And it makes sense, uh, you know, now that we are living at home or, uh, or working at home or living at work, however you want to think about it, um, we're being constantly distracted and being pulled by the many roles and responsibilities that we have in life. Consistent with this idea, most employees in our survey data say that they're completing more chores now than before the COVID lockdown. They're completing more necessities, it's harder to outsource, and we're also engaging in less active leisure. In our data, women and working moms are disproportionately affected, as you've probably been hearing in the news, our data really supports this assertion. In our data, women, uh, if extrapolated our data to the upcoming next year, women as compared to working, uh, working women as compared to working men will have 12 more days of chores. Um, so women are currently completing 8% eight more, 8 more necessities and chores than men. And that means they'll complete 12 complete calendar days more of chores than men by the end of the upcoming year. And they're also will engage in five fewer calendar days of active leisure, volunteering, exercising, socializing as compared to working men, if we extrapolated my data, uh, you know, one year in the future. So this suggests that although working from home can provide flexibility and the opportunity um, to engage in more active leisure, 
we are finding in our survey data that most employees are feeling more distracted, like <laughs> probably because they have kittens in their, uh, my uh, cat just like ran through my office right now, uh, that they're feeling more distracted. They're engaging in less productive work, more unproductive work, and their house care and child care demands have increased. Um, so although working from home provides the opportunity to have greater time affluence, we are all feeling more time poor than ever before. And as I mentioned before, time poverty can come at a cost to our happiness. The experience of not feeling like you have enough time to do all the things you want to do or have to do, regardless of how much money you have in the bank, your gender, your personality, can is negatively linked in my data to unhappiness. It predicts greater stress, uh, a greater likelihood of getting divorced, even worse physical health outcomes, because when you're feeling overwhelmed, you can barely uh, kind of put one step in front of the other in terms of work and personal life and are not making time for self-care. Um, part of this is driven by the autonomy paradox. So our technology was supposed to free us from the office, but instead we're taking our offices everywhere we go. And this is known in the organizational behavior literature as the autonomy paradox. And so even when we are in what we would classify as a leisure activity on a weekend, we're being constantly disrupted or pulled into our technology, which brings us out of the present moment and also creates a sense of goal conflict where we wonder if we shouldn't really be enjoying our leisure, we should go back to our computers instead. And this is one of the key time traps I talk about in my book that can lead us to feel time poor. And in part, we are constantly connected to our devices because our organizations reward and recognize this behavior. In the absence of objective performance criteria, it's become harder to understand how to reward and recognize employees. So we use quickness of responses and hours worked as a proxy for quality and commitment in our workplaces today more than ever before. And so this, these kinds of social, psych, uh, social organizational factors can really make all of us feel that our time is not our own. But going back to this uh, Ed Diener quote, which I think is so important, we do have ways in which all of us, regardless of how much we work or what our career is, that we can make daily decisions each and every day to have more and better time and in turn improve our happiness, reduce our time poverty, and leave lead happier and more meaningful lives. So I'm going to quickly talk through four strategies based on research that we can all use in our life, even during COVID, and especially right now to have um, more sustainable um, daily work lives um, and feel less time poor and more time affluent. The first strategy is cultivating a time first mindset. I've done a lot of research showing that individuals who generally say that they prioritize time over money and who are willing to give up money in order to have more free time report greater life overall life evaluation and also experience greater joy and less stress on an everyday basis. And this is true across the socioeconomic status spectrum. Um, also true for men and women. Older individuals are slightly more likely to value time over money. This is consistent with Laura Carsonson's work on socio-selectivity theory. Um, as we get older, we spend more time and become more focused on meaningful pursuits. We also feel more financially secure, which is a predictor. So although income doesn't predict our preferences, how financially secure we feel does. Um, and so in this current economic recession, when so many of us are worried about our financial futures, um, it's easy to become more money focused, to be willing to give up our time in order to have more money. But I show that those who are most time poor benefit from making time first choices even when they are feeling um, unsure about their financial futures. And we can come back to that in the q and I just mentioned this before. So there are some demographic differences between who's willing to give up money to have more time and who's willing to give up time to have more money. Um, I also do show evidence for why this time first mindset really cultivates greater subjective well-being. People who have a time first mindset spend fewer hours a week working, so they're more efficient at work, and they also spend more time engaged in active leisure, which we know is good for happiness. Importantly, people who are willing to give up money in order to have more free time, who see time as their most valuable resource, spend more time on an everyday basis interacting and engaging in so, uh, and interacting with those around them. In one study where I measured students' values three months before coming into the lab, 
I found that students who had this time first mindset spent 18% more time socializing with a peer that they had never met than students who were more focused on money, productivity, and efficiency had this money first mindset. Um, and that's likely because they felt the visceral costs of staying and socializing more strongly than those who valued time. And these results held controlling for extroversion, which you might imagine could otherwise explain this relationship. We also recently published a paper this last year in Science Advances showing that this time first mindset can almost uh, put us on a more positive happiness trajectory over the course of our lives. Um, so we tracked 2,000 college students in Canada and asked them whether they valued time or whether they valued money. Students who valued time more than money were more likely to choose intrinsically motivating careers, so doing jobs because they wanted to versus they had to. And this predicted their happiness and satisfaction two to three years after graduation, even controlling for their baseline levels of happiness. Uh, we've recently replicated these results in the COVID context, and we actually see a really interesting pattern emerging. College students are starting to become more time focused in what they want out of their careers, especially in response to wanting to feel like they have a job that is meaningful and is contributing positively to society. So this idea of uh, being engaged in an intrinsically motivating, intrinsically satisfying career and doing something that has a positive societal benefit is stronger now um, as a result of the COVID pandemic than it has been in the past. Now, it is okay to be money and work focused. I joke in the book and it's still true in my life now given that I'm pretty early on in my career postgraduate school is that I'm still fairly work and productivity focused and that is still okay. Um, after years of graduate school, I'm focused on work and prioritizing my career. And that's true for so many of us, again, especially in this current economic situation. However, there are other strategies that don't involve making major life decisions or necessarily always prioritizing time, but rather prioritizing time around the margins that can help all of us live a more meaningful and fulfilling life. The second strategy that I talk about is this idea of finding time. You can also think about this as doing a time audit. And I think it's more important now than it ever has been before, um, especially as we're working from home and the days blur together. Um, we find, at least I find myself engaged in more mindless activity. It takes me a lot more deliberation to make sure I'm spending my time in intentional ways. So one way you can conduct a time audit is in a way that's consistent with research on the day reconstruction methodology by Daniel Kahneman and colleagues with uh, some modification here by Paul Dolan and his colleagues at London School of Economics. So you wanna think about a typical work day in the middle of the week. A work day is when most of us feel stressed by the demands of work and life. And think about what you did yesterday in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. Then think about classifying your activities in terms of positive and negative experiences. So was the activity uh, put you at ease? Or it's actually, did the uh, activity put you at ease? Was it positive? Or did it make you stressed out? Did it make you feel negative? And then was the activity productive, meaningful, or unproductive. Um, so it is possible that some of the things that we do on an everyday basis are productive, but stressful. Training for a marathon, taking care of our kids, they're helping us uh, achieve important, meaningful goals in life, but can feel stressful in the moment. So those are okay activities to have. Also, some activities are productive and fun. We wanna be thinking about maximizing those. That's the top right-hand quadrant. Um, and some of the, our activities are relaxing but unproductive, vegging out on the couch, watching your favorite TV show, and we all need some of that as well. However, in this lower left quadrant are activities that are both mindless and make us stressed out. You can think of this as all the doom scrolling we've been doing lately. And interestingly, research suggests that we're even more likely to engage in these stressful yet unproductive activities when we are feeling ourselves overwhelmed. So this is known as a mere urgency effect. It explains why your inbox goes to zero when you're working under a major uh, deadline. We want the quick win of checking an email, scheduling a meeting for next week, um, checking our favorite social media site and feeling like we learned something new especially when we're feeling stressed out. So in this very challenging and stressful time, we wanna be especially mindful of these activities that make us feel stressed and are unproductive, and then think about how we might be able to minimize the negative. So get, 
get rid of or stop doing some of the activities in this quadrant and try to maximize the positive. So start doing more of and being more mindful and intentional to put into your calendar activities that are either pleasant or meaningful or both. We can actually deliberately put into our calendars what I call proactive blocks of time. So these are, we put in uh, time in our calendar each day to prioritize the important as opposed to the urgent. We recently ran this experiment in a large uh, Salesforce team. And we found that after six weeks of scheduling time, uninterrupted time for important, not urgent tasks, that these employees treat it as if it was their most important meeting with their boss. So that was our, our, our contingency here. You had to actually keep these blocks of time. Employees felt that they were 14% more efficient. They also reported lower levels of stress and burnout. So we wanna think about how we waste our time and then actively or be proactive in scheduling time to work on important, meaningful, positive activities that are not necessarily urgent or feel urgent, but are important nonetheless, like an educational opportunity or our favorite workout. Now, I would be remiss as a happiness researcher who studies time to not say that one way to find time is to say no. <laughs> it's the best way to get more time in the future. Our research does suggest a really important caveat. If you're going to say no, if you're going to decline a social or work-related request, do not say you don't have time to do it. Time is a social good, and it signals what we care about. So if we say we don't have enough time to do something, the other person insinuates that or reads into that as if you don't wanna do whatever it is they're asking. So you don't wanna say you can't do something because you don't have time. A money-related energy excuse or providing no excuse at all is better than saying you're too busy. The third strategy is this idea of funding time. I also spend a lot of research in my, a uh, lot of time in my dissertation studying this idea that we wanna, again, be thinking about maximizing our U index and labor economics uh, speak or you know, Mac focusing on the positive and minimizing the negative to get to greater life satisfaction and happiness in our everyday life. And one clear mechanism is giving up some of our discretionary income to have more time by outsourcing our most disliked tasks to others. So we've run studies all over the world, correlational surveys and an experiment showing that people who spend money to outsource their most disliked tasks to others and people who spend money to save themselves time deliberately each month report greater overall life satisfaction, less stress, and greater happiness. This doesn't have to be a lot of money. We can get the happiness gains of time-saving purchases from as little as $40 in our survey data. One of my college students bought an automatic coffee machine that brewed coffee and also served as their alarm so they didn't have to fumble around for coffee in the dark every morning. Another student of mine bought a used bike so they didn't have to walk to work. These are two uh, good examples of time-saving purchases made by my budget-constrained students that I think are good illustrations that all of us can think about reallocating some of our discretionary income away from material purchases that don't bring as much consistent joy to purchases that will help save us time on an everyday basis. We're also seeing in our data that romantic couples who spend money on time-saving purchases, especially during the pandemic, are reporting the greatest benefits and the least amount of stress. So we have some new data showing that the effects are about double the strength and magnitude now um, during this uh, lockdown period as they were before uh, for working couples, again, with young kids at home. So you wanna think about spending money to save yourself and your partner time. And we find that these benefits are driven by couples being able to spend more quality time with one another. Um, there's a couple of caveats to this that I think are fun from my data that you want to make sure you actually spend that time together. If you make time-saving purchases and don't spend that time with your romantic partner, you don't get the same relationship satisfaction benefits, unsurprisingly. You also don't want to outsource or give your partner a gift of a household chore that they wish you did. Um, so I observed this so often in, in my household growing up and also see it in my data where my dad would get my mom a house cleaning service as a present for the holidays and she just wished he would clean the house more. And so you don't wanna highlight any chore discrepancy. So you wanna make sure you're making these decisions together if you decide to pick up this strategy. And the last strategy I'll mention doesn't involve any money at all. And it's this idea of reframing time. So there's so many tasks in our life that we can't get out of um, and that 
there's so many times in our life that we wish we were thinking about things differently. So we might not be able to outsource. We might not always be able to delegate our tasks to others at work. So this is another strategy to, toward um, kind of removing tasks that feel uh, unpleasant. We can actually think about um, the fact that if sometimes we take on tasks at work, for example, that actually might be better for someone else more um, junior to us to do. So sometimes, for example, in my life, I might say yes to taking on a paper when really I should be thinking about um, that as a mentorship opportunity for one of my students. So if it's going to be something that's not going to, it's going to feel kind of stressful for me, or I don't feel like I have time for, it, but I'm saying yes anyway, I should be reframing that as an opportunity to be a mentorship uh, option for someone that I work with. We can also think about reframing all these low level tasks that so many of us have to do paperwork demands have increased in all professions, law, physicians, academics. Um, and it's just a fact of, uh, of knowledge work that many of us have to complete paperwork. My dis my doctoral student has research showing that if you frame these um, idle tasks as a way to help your colleagues get their work done or to uh, help your organization meet its organizational mission, you feel the opportunity costs less strongly and you feel more positive about completing those tasks simply by reminding yourself that you doing the task helps someone in your organization do their work better. When it comes to um, leisure activities, so we do get more happiness from engaging in active leisure activities like exercising, volunteering, praying, engaging in hobbies, and uh, socializing intimate relations. Just uh, the graph looks like they're negative, but they're typically really positive experiences. So just, um, just uh, don't read in too much to this specific uh, uh, beta coefficient way I'm plotting this. But one thing that my colleagues have found um, that is one reframing technique so that we engage in even more active leisure and really get more satisfaction from our leisure is treating our weekend like a vacation. So my colleagues ran this very clever experiment where they randomly assigned people to just think about their upcoming weekend or to think about their upcoming weekend and treat it like a vacation. And individuals in their study who are treating an upcoming weekend like a vacation said they reported feeling less pulled by the demands of work. They spent more time engaged in active leisure activities and they were able to savor their moments more than when just treating that time like a regular weekend. So that's something we could all put into practice going into this weekend. And the last strategy I want to remind people of is that it's really important in the context of being deliberate about time to be reflective, to build in a bit of time to ask yourself what quality time means to you and how you're going to get more of it. From an empirical perspective, quality time in my data is any time that you're spending engaged in activity where you feel supported by people that you care about, that puts you in a positive mood, and that helps you be present in the moment. So for all of us, those activities might look different meditating, um, doing a Zoom workout class, uh, having virtual coffee hour with a friend, but we really want to be thinking about finding opportunities to spend quality time with those that we care about. We can do that by avoiding time traps. So I talked a little bit about this, but we often think we're going to have more time in the future than we do in the present. And busyness can be a status symbol in our workplaces. So we want to kind of start becoming rec in recognition of when we are engaged in a time trap thinking we're going to be able to take on more work tasks in the future than we could in the present and think and really ask ourselves whether checking that email is something we need to do or we just feel like we have to or should because of the appearance the impression management concerns that we have in our workplaces i also want to depart with this idea that i think is especially important right now related to the current covid situation is that focusing on time is not selfish. I do see in my data and people often report to me, focusing on time seems like something you do when other parts of your life are worked out, your next career move, et cetera. But, right, um, but my research really suggests that the most time affluent among us are the ones that um, are the most satisfied in their jobs have better social relationships. And so in my data, focusing on time is not selfish. We need to remind ourselves, especially right now, um, that we take care of ourselves by lightening up and not being so hard on ourselves. This is an, a writer, a uh, poet that I really like. At times, life seems to be one never-ending to-do list, but we must learn to disrupt the flood of life's demands to replenish our energy so we can fully show up to all of our passions and responsibilities. And in my data, 
um, actually reframing time-saving purchases as a way to be pro-social and to spend more quality time with those that we love helps people be more likely to make those purchases. So in general, we need to remind ourselves that actually data suggests that focusing on time isn't selfish. In fact, if anything, it's pro-social as people who are more time focused and feel more time affluent are better able and more likely to help those around them. Just a few quick additional slides before um, I get into questions. Um, there has been my, my uh, colleagues and I have been advocating for using time use strategies, especially in this work from home environment. So one thing that we're noticing in our qualitative data is that breaks, boundaries, and transitions have gone missing in the work from home environment. So as much as I used to harp on commutes as being some of the most miserable and stressful moments of people's day, um, commutes actually do provide an important transition point between work and home and home and work that's gone missing in the virtual environment. Microsoft recently took our suggestion and put it into practice by encouraging all of their employees to take a virtual commute into the office before they started the day. Um, and so they have a, a calendar hold on all of their employees' uh, calendars where their employees are no longer able to schedule meetings into the block that you used to go where their commutes would go. So that eight to nine slot that we see is being filled with work. So I encourage all of us to think about um, not just going rolling out of bed and going straight to our computers, but to engage in active leisure, social activities, or quality time prior to starting the workday. Similarly, we want to be thinking about giving ourselves a boundary at the end of the day, something positive and a leisure activity to look forward to, so we don't just keep working past when we might have otherwise worked when we were working in an office. Proactive time and focusing on must wins has never been more important. And what we're hearing from our survey data is organizations are gonna to have to continue to allow for remote work and flexible work and to rethink work structures. What I'm seeing and hearing in my survey data and talking to employees is that they are actually spending, there's a bit of a silver lining, they report spending a little bit more time with friends and family now, of course, especially media household members because we're all working from home. Um, and people want even more of that, so I think Thinking about restructuring work will be something that COVID, the COVID situation has accelerated trends that we are already observing. We also need to be thinking very strategically, not only about balancing work and life, but how to get all of the things that we need in a work day. So we're doing a large project with a management consulting firm and looking at the types of time that go missing and that can prevent all of us from getting our meaningful work done. So we wanna be thinking about leaving Slack in our schedule between meetings so we can debrief, synthesize, sense make information that's just happened. And also so we can get some of this informal social interaction, this water cooler conversation that's gone missing in the virtual environment. So I would be remiss as a behavioral scientist not to ask us to all engage in an implementation intention. So I'd like everyone to take a few seconds now to write down one element of their life that they will try to change in the next 24 hours to have more control and better control over their time. And of course, they need to, you need to tell someone about it so that they can hold you accountable. Um, so that's uh, the formal part of my uh, presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now. And as I mentioned, I have an HBR called Time for Happiness and a book that just came out. And everything that, um, as Alki was saying, that I've been talking about today is documented in, this is uh, some of the research papers that have come out of my lab or that I've collaborated on with uh, people over the years, including a lot of students that have been a really meaningful uh, activity for me uh, over the last several years. So I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Perfect, thanks so much, Ashley. Um, if, if you'd like to just uh, say, like, tell, say your question out loud, we'd be happy if you do that. Uh, you can raise your hand and then we can just allow you, give you permission to speak. Uh, I guess the first question, Ashley, is um, from, from, from Leonard, um, he's asking about the issue of reverse causality. And if you'd like to even explain what that is to everyone in case uh, uh, it's not a hundred percent clear for everyone. Uh, and so yeah, he's so yeah, so this is a great question. And my correlational data that I presented originally showing that people who value time over money are happier. We can't rule out the possibility that happier people might be more likely to value time. So in correlational data, you're looking at patterns, but you can't necessarily say which variable is causing which. So the reason that happier people might be more likely to value time is because they have better ways to spend time, more meaningful hobbies, better social relationships. Um, so the best data that we have that kind of rules out or at least says 
says it's not completely explained by reverse causality is this longitudinal study that we published last year showing that controlling for baseline levels of happiness, this individual difference in the extent to which in students were willing to value time over money predicted changes in well-being over time. Um, and so there you can kind of see that even though we didn't actually observe that happier people were more likely to value time in that data, but even to the extent that there was some sort of unexplored relationship between valuing time and happiness at time one, we can say that even controlling for the, that relationship at time one, time, uh, the valuing time measure is predicting changes in happiness across time, even controlling for baseline happiness. That said, it's still correlational, so we can't rule out um, every third variable, but that's why we've also run uh, experiments on this question, and one of our colleagues has actually randomly assigned people to kind of try to live this value of prioritizing time over money versus money over time and shown causal effects on well-being. So that provides uh, some of the stronger evidence that it's not a reverse causality story, that we see some predicted validity of time, predicting happiness across time, uh, independently of how happy people were to begin with. Right. Uh, we have a question uh, from Tiago uh, from Brazil who would like to congrats uh, to, to give you congratulations <laughs> for your excellent explanation about the key theme of our lives. So uh, the question is uh, about the treating weekends as vacation time. Don't you think that the, the project that project too much activities will be uh, more dangerous? So this is a great question and related to some of Salon Malik's and other uh, of our collaborators work, Sanford Devo and Jeff Pfeiffer, looking at whether um, thinking about the economic value of time, so trying to extract as much value as we can from our free time and from time in general might undermine our uh, satisfaction. So there is a little bit of research suggesting that when you schedule leisure, um, that this makes it feel like work and so you're less likely to enjoy the happiness benefits of leisure activities. I think the one clever thing about reframing is they didn't tell people what to do. They just reminded people to take a more vacation mindset going into the weekend. However, I don't think that they would have seen the same effects if they would have said treat the treat the weekend like a vacation and then schedule as many activities as you can that are positive. So we do have to take all this um, into consideration when thinking about importing these ideas in our own lives. We don't want to schedule leisure back to back to back or even put too much of it in our calendar in structured ways because it removes some of the benefit, the spontaneity of these leisure activities and leisure starts to feel more like work. But I do think we need to at least rough schedule our leisure into our calendars to make sure that we actually follow through to do it. Because most of us, especially in the US, maybe less so in Brazil, um, which we also have data on, are more likely to prioritize work than leisure when left to their own devices. Uh, all right, next question. I'm gonna ask Naim to talk. So Naim, you have the microphone on. Hi, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I enjoyed it and I'm enjoying reading your book. Uh, I just have a question related to uh, how individual differences in uh, maybe defining time or approaching time poverty might uh, affect or undermine relationships, whether it's my relationship with my coworker or my partner. Uh, if we define time differently or quality time is different for us, does that have a positive or negative effect on relationship or uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is a great question. So we started to move up a level. So you're, you're hitting at a key theme that I think this research stands to benefit more from, which is this idea that our, a lot of our time and money decisions don't happen in a vacuum. So I presented a lot of research looking at the individual level, but we know that of course, organizational and relationship factors play a role in these decisions that we make around time and money. Kathleen McGinn and Hannah riley Bowles have a great kind of a discussion of this in regard to two level negotiations. So you first negotiate the job and then you negotiate the job with your partner. And I think a similar idea kind of applies here. So we do see some data and we're trying to explore this in more detail now, but we have a working paper with Mike Norton and Jesse Powell showing that time-saving purchases can um, increase relationship conflict, especially if partners don't agree. So this is why it's so important that you're having these discussions together actively in a joint manner with your partner um, and not making it and then springing it on them later. So it, when it comes to time-saving purchases in particular and decisions that will affect both of you, you really need to be making them uh, together in conjunction with one another. Um, and more research is needed to sort of unpack how to have those conversations. But in general, I think thinking about time and money more as collective resources is 
something where our field is starting to move in that direction and more work is needed. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. Another question from JD, and then I'm gonna ask Farah to talk as well. Uh, hi JD, by the way. And uh, the question is, uh, again, for the, for the doing nothing time, uh, if you have anything else to say. So uh, he's asking, what do you think of the Dutch concept of Nixon or, or some time for doing nothing? Uh, and that on your chart, it seemed pretty negative. Yeah, so this is interesting. Those data are from this SPBS paper where we're looking at the differences in time use and happiness among millionaires versus representative samples of Europeans and specifically among individuals living in the Netherlands. So I think that effect might have been especially negative because more affluent samples prioritize leisure and see the economic value of their time is high and therefore the opportunity cost of their time is also high. And so passive leisure activities like doing nothing are seem, seen as somewhat negative. Um, I don't think that we would observe those effects everywhere. I think that might have been a little bit idiosyncratic to the uh, millionaire samples we were studying there. But I do think it's interesting in general, we do see that there are country level differences in the extent to which individuals um, prioritize and get benefit from leisure. So we have a new working paper with, led by George Ward, a PhD student at MIT, showing that there's even regional uh, variability within the US around Protestant work ethic beliefs. So if you believe that leisure is wasteful or that leisure is a moral sin, um, then you don't engage in active, you don't engage in leisure to the same extent and condi conditional on engaging in leisure, you don't enjoy active leisure to the same extent if the norms are, are both active and passive leisure, sorry, uh, to the same extent. So you, we were expecting we might see a difference between active leisure, where if leisure is seen as lazy, but your leisure is purposeful, that you might enjoy it more under high uh, Protestant work ethic. But that's not what we observe. We kind of see this overall less satisfaction being derived from leisure um, when under these high Protestant work, work ethic beliefs. So it does su suggest in general that both local and geographic norms play a role in the extent to which we're going to drive enjoyment from certain kinds of leisure activities. Um, and so we've been trying to think about or in, or in early stages of a project thinking about how we can legitimize leisure so that individuals see it as productive and as something they want to engage in so that they're getting more satisfaction out of active and passive leisure activities, although active tend to be associated more with uh, greater happiness. I guess I'll, I'll take it before I take it too far. I'm gonna um, uh, read to you Eric's uh, comment uh, that counterintuitive time uh, used through intense doing nothing leads to more time effective uh, successful accomplishments. Uh, what What is your take for, for that? Yeah, so I think that um, we do need to make time in our calendar and space to work on important but not necessarily urgent tasks. And there's pretty good correlational data suggesting that the most productive individuals within a firm or an organizational context are those that take all of their paid vacation or are um, taking breaks more often and working fewer hours on average. Um, I think that it feels um, counterintuitive, but effort does not necessarily produce quality or hours does not necessarily produce quality depending on the kind of work that you do. So in more creative professions, um, having some space walking away and spending a little bit less time nose to grindstone can produce this more um, divergent thinking, which is a hallmark of creativity. So we found this even in some unpublished data that I conducted uh, during my graduate studies, that even the feeling of open-ended time, even if you have the same objective amount of time available, makes people perform better on creativity tasks because they don't feel like they're trying to kind of get all of the, be super efficient so they're more able to draw novel connections between ideas so this might be part of uh, the driving effect although the research i'm presenting is correlational not causal right farah arabe you're uh, allowed to talk <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that permission. Um, uh, thank you for this talk. It's, it's been wonderful and very interesting. Um, I, I just had one comment and, and a question. And my comment, I think, revolves around what we were already talking about on, on emphasizing uh, perhaps a redefinition of productivity. I was particularly surprised when I heard you say that in one of your surveys, parents, uh, especially those with young children, are the ones who feel less, the least productive. And, and how parents in this question are probably associating productivity with economic productivity when actually raising children is something extremely productive yeah. for our society. And so how, 
I guess my comment goes to, um, I guess, what is the importance of, of redefining productivity um, and having people think of productivity also as being socially productive, emotionally productive, even if it's for yourself, uh, because at the end of the day, our emotional well-being is, is also a resource to others. So that was, what, that was my comment. Um, and then the question that I had was, um, what would be your message for, for societies and communities uh, where where poverty, financial poverty, uh, prevents them from from perhaps funding time or giving up time, um, sorry, giving up money in order to maximize time for other purposes. And I, and I see here uh, one of the papers that you have written uh, is about alleviating time poverty among the working poor. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Thank yeah, I, yeah. Thank you so much for your comment and also your question. Um, so I definitely think that society would benefit from a redefinition of productivity away from economic productivity to social uh, productivity. And we do have one paper, I'm not sure if it's listed here. Um, no, it's not, but uh, with Lucia Macchia, who's uh, my postdoc, so we published it in the Journal of Positive Psychology last year using data from the World Value Survey. And we see that societies with a higher proportion of respondents who value leisure, family, friends, overwork, um, also are countries that typically uh, report greater happiness. And this is holds controlling for whether you, we look at higher or lower GDP countries. So it really actually suggests that countries that have been able to cultivate this greater recognition of um, productivity outside of economics do fare better in terms of their happiness overall. And what was particularly mm -hmm. interesting in that data set is we also looked at um, uh, the emotional response at the country level to the 2008 economic recession. And we see that countries with a higher proportion of respondents that value leisure over work are also countries um, that are not as negatively emotionally impacted by economic recessions, which of course makes sense of your identity and your livelihood and who you are as a person is wrapped up around your economic productivity, as you point out um, very helpfully, then of course an economic recession will feel more emotionally negative um, than if you have your value drive not just at work but outside of it in friends, family, and hobbies. So there is a case to be made for this um, for this reshift in our priorities. And of course, those countries that were scoring high on leisure over work beliefs in their citizens were uh, Scandinavian countries, countries that have strong social policies. Mm -hmm. So I think in order to enact that societal shift, um, it's actually going to take government policies um, and organizational policies to help create norms that enable and empower individuals to say that, hey, I don't need to focus everything on economic productivity, but I think in the US, um, you know, that's where organizational leadership and, and country like a state level leadership and is really needed because it's mm -hmm. gonna be very hard for an individual to push back against a social structure um, mm -hmm. that is really focused on economic productivity being the be all and end all of our lives. Um, mm -hmm. So until incentive structures change in organizations, which as a, my time in the business school, I've really heard a lot of major companies really trying to um, have flexibility and paid time off and see it as a point of differentiation. I think conversations are moving in that direction, um, mm -hmm. but I think we really do need kind of organizational and societal shifts to help all of us feel empowered to put non-economic uh, concerns first. We really need to feel empowered by our organizations and society to do that. Mm -hmm. And then on the second part of your uh, question, we have mm -hmm. uh, exactly on this point, I was doing a lot of research in so-called weird countries, Western educated, mm -hmm. industrialized, rich democratic countries. And so got a lot of questions around like, does time matter? And um, how does the relationship between time and happiness play out in, in other countries, especially financially constrained environments? Um, mm -hmm. And so when I became a faculty member a few years ago, I, I set out on a set of series, a couple of research projects, major ones, um, looking exactly at this because I was reading Indira Hirway's book um, on a development economist and really kind of saying mm -hmm people who are financially constrained also tend to be the most time poor. And this was consistent with data mm -hmm. that I had collected in my dissertation showing um, that the individuals in my studies who were making, who were struggling to make ends meet benefited the most from making time-saving purchases, but they didn't obviously make them that often, but they were the ones who were benefiting mm -hmm. the most. In part, when you think about financial constraints, you also think it's easy to neglect the time cost, but people who are financially constrained work multiple jobs or time is more fragmented. They might be constantly searching for jobs. They might be single parents, pre 
COVID or even now, they might be essential workers commuting very far distances to get to their places of employment on public transportation, which takes a long time. So there are many mm -hmm. situational factors that are making individuals who are financially constrained also time poor. We recently came uh, ran a large scale RCT um, looking at the effect of cash transfers, time-saving vouchers, um, and smaller cash transfers on working women in um, an informal settlement in Nairobi, Kenya, um, on their subjective well-being perceived stress. So we gave three um, time-saving vouchers uh, that were valued at about one day's paid uh, labor for three consecutive mm -hmm. weeks. We're now running longer, larger studies. but um, And we found that cash and time performed similarly in benefiting women's well-being, reducing stress, mm -hmm. and promoting relationship satisfaction, and reducing relationship conflict uh, in this sample via different mechanisms. So time savings seem to reduce the burden of unpaid labor and in turn produce mm -hmm. greater well-being and cash transfers in this sample um, mm -hmm. reduce perceived financial burdens in turn producing well-being benefits. So we saw that both cash and time performed equally, suggesting that we need to both recognize as policymakers financial and temporal constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're following up on some of these data in Rajasthan, India, where we're giving girls um, water collection tanks uh, tank us so they don't have to uh, go and collect water, which saves them about eight to 10 hours every day. And then we're also providing with educational enrollment fees um, because chores were a barrier for educational attainment. So we think mm -hmm. that there is traction for this idea of mm -hmm. thinking not only of uh, financial constraints, but thinking about temporal constraints when thinking about how to help people help themselves who are faced with a financially difficult situation and who are living in poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're currently implementing research projects along these lines. And I think uh, this is aligned with what Cass Sunstein talks a lot about, um, reducing friction and reducing ordeal costs should disproportionately affect and benefit those who are financially constrained. So this argument is consistent with that, um, with the work in writing that he's done as well. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that goes well with uh, with what we're discussing, and, and for those that are interested in Kassenstein's work uh, on, on the subject that Ashley just mentioned, there is a video from our talks that you can see, I can share for, for after the after this session. So the question is, if you are uh, familiar with the Workaholics Anonymous, the 12 step <laughs> program, uh, that suggests it's a, it's an like an addictive uh, situation, uh, and then that they cap the times for up to fifty hours. And for those that are more interested interested to learn more, you can uh, visit the Q and A and see what the participant is saying. So what what are your thoughts? So uh, Ashley, are you familiar? Uh, you no, know? I I mean I haven't heard of this, but I I do know the four day work week people really well. Um, and I would say that this sounds like a great idea. And again, I would advocate for the idea of not doing this in isolation. So I have a project with Leslie Perlow, who's a tenured professor in the organizational behavior department, and coined the term time poverty in 1999 in an uh, ASQ paper that she wrote on uh, knowledge workers, and who I'm like so. Uh, enthusiastic to be working on a project with. She's an ethnographer. So she goes into companies and tries to understand what's works and what doesn't. And one thing that we are really advocating for, again, is thinking about time through our interviews as a, at a, as a collective resource. We think about managing our own calendar with often very little regard to how our decisions are influencing our team. Um, and so I think something like Workaholics Anonymous or the four day work week is gonna be the most successful when you can also create an ecosystem uh, around an individual employee that will make them feel as if they can take the time they need um, and actually work fewer hours than they do currently. And we have data suggesting um, J1, uh, one, uh, my PhD student has a dissertation on the fact that we don't request time even for relatively costless requests. So we don't ask for more time and adjustable deadlines at work, even though we know that we probably could and that it would benefit the quality of our work because we're so worried about these impression costs in the workplace, so worried about what uh, managers are going to think of us. And across all of our, our studies, these uh, fears are unfounded. So managers actually see employees who ask for more time before the deadline is passed, not after, um, see uh, their employees as more motivated and more competent um, than uh, even employees who don't ask for a deadline extension request because it signals you care about quality. Um, and so even in relatively simple, costless actions like asking for more time on an adjustable deadline at work, we seem reticent um, to ask for more time. And so you can extrapolate those findings to taking vacation or asking for leave that these are really stressful conversations. And so we need to be setting up mechanisms in our organizations which allow employees to feel as if 
they can actually make these requests that would benefit ultimately themselves and their employers. Gonna, uh, it's, it's about a minute left, so I'm gonna pass it to Rod, the president, so he can <laughs> give us the last question. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, Thank you for a very thought-provoking um, presentation. I do have a question. You know, it seems to me that many of your research groups, understandably, are employed people or uh, students in studies. And of course, you've done quite a variety of populations, including millionaires. I want to ask about retired people, such as myself, and make an observation that when you are retiring, everybody will say to you, oh, you will be busier than ever, whether you believe it or not. And I have a couple of observations about that. One is it seems to be true. The other is it seems to be totally false. Or to put it a little differently, I think when we retire, we have a different mental perception of our own time. It's as though the hour is now 45 minutes long. You know, we all know that the dollar can devalue. I think there's something about retirement that helps the hour to get devalued as well. So we feel as though we're as busy as ever or more so, and yet perhaps we're not. And that's just a thought. It'd be fun to find out if that's really the, the case. I think retired people would also make a great population because at least in, in my case, I'm on a pension. I don't really have to worry about using my time for earning income versus not. And yet I'm crazy busy, um, sometimes very happily and sometimes not. So uh, I, I'm not giving you any answers. I'm just suggesting when you get around to us, it might be really interesting. Yeah, this is great. So I have a few thoughts and comments on this. We do want to think about optimizing our busyness. So sometimes people ask, can you be two time affluent? The answer is yes, you need to be thinking about filling your time with meaningful activities and feeling some sense of busyness um, as opposed to idleness since we do have idleness aversion. And one of my colleagues has done some really interesting research in refugee camps actually showing this forced idleness is really bad for well being. But if you give people meaningful or, or even semi meaningful work to do, it increases their happiness by quite a lot again so her her research is like on the sits on the other side of my research and both of us together say kind of you want to kind of find this optimal spot for you where you have enough things to do even maybe a little bit of stress to keep you interested but not you not to the point that you're feeling overwhelmed. There is research in cognitive neuroscience suggesting that our time perception does change as we get older. Time does speed up. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, our, our actual perception of time is that it moves more quickly as we get older. And there's a whole bunch of interesting review papers uh, about why that might be the case. So we've had a lot of similar experiences. So our brain is not um, processing all of the information to the same extent. And then all, also our neuro Neuro, neurology changes and so that could be one of the other components but this kind of like experience uh, stretching uh, hypothesis that you've just had a lot more experiences so your brain is kind of going through heuristics um, makes your time perception speed up seems to be the predominant theory of the day at least right now um, in what I've read and then in terms of retirement I do think it's really interesting so I have a paper that uh, with my postdoc I uh, at HKS, Aisha, um, and she uh, has some data suggesting that using instrumental variable approaches from economics that gets you sort of at causality, at least for people who kind of actually follow through um, the, the treatment of uh, compliers, if you will, that in response to age um, financial incentives, so age-based pensions, um, and if people actually retire in response to these financial um, in, uh, incentives that uh, individuals get show significant increases in meaning, um, not decreases as a function of retiring, and that this is especially true among individuals who didn't love their jobs before they retired and were making less money because they are substituting the time that they were spending working with more time with their grandkids, more social activities and hobbies. So I think I think it you're like you're right, retirement's super interesting population to study. And Jeff Steiner, who's a PhD student at HBS, is doing some qualitative narrative research around how we reform our identity entities during the retirement period of time that also might be of interest for people to look into. He's definitely more of an expert on that than I am, but I think you raised some interesting points. Thank you.
Actually, because we want everyone to be happy, we're going to respect everyone's time. And <laughs> yeah, sorry, I know the time researcher can't overrun time. I would just not not be very good with it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Thank you so much, Ashley Willans, for, for this talk. People are already um, messaging me, telling me that they're starting to work on their calendars and their decisions. So that was very Perfect, helpful. yes, pre-commit. They pre commit. And yeah, they send, <laughs> sending these emails, everyone, and you know, I'll be your accountability buddy. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. you. Right, next Take time. care. Bye. -bye.